design. And there is a reason underneath this travesty. And it's the fact that when you look at who pays for our elections, it's less than 1% of the population that pays for all the campaigning, all the advertising that you have to endure. Now that's happening right here in the state of Wisconsin. This place that we all inherited, there is not a one of you in this room old enough to remember a time when Wisconsin was a political cesspool in your childhood. We all inherited this place, this special place that was a beacon of clean and open and honest government, known for squeaky clean politics from one post to another. That was our inheritance. You all would remember a fellow named Bill Proxmire who ran for statewide office in Wisconsin and was elected repeatedly by the people of this state, and Bill Proxmire never spent more than $300 on one of his campaigns. He ran for statewide office for $100 or $150, bucks, never spent more than $300. That was in our lifetime that we saw somebody able to successfully seek and hold one of the highest offices in our land and spend no more than 300 bucks getting there. And we just went through a, a race for governor in 2010, where by our best accounting, and I will be the first to say that we cannot account for all the spending. We don't know every penny that was, that was poured into all the campaigning that was done, but we can account for at least $37.4 million that was spent electing a governor. And so in our lifetime, we've gone from seeing somebody able to seek and hold one of the highest offices in the land and spend $300 getting there to a point where $37 million is spent electing a governor. And, and we see what we've got. And the amazing thing, the thing that you really have to come to terms with, is of that $37.4 million that we can account for, all of the television advertising you had to endure, all the radio ads, all the robocalls that were on your answering machine or your voicemail, all the junk mail that you got in your mailbox, all the billboards, all the signs, all the literature, everything that, we, that was spent electing a governor was paid for by less than 1% of the population. And what we get as a result is essentially a system of welfare. The less than 1% that do all the camp that pay for all the campaigning, then are richly rewarded by those who are elected for office with tax breaks and pork barrel spending and patronage jobs for their kids, and, and, and they get they get sweetheart deals, no bid contracts on, on for state government work. By our research, what we've found on average is that for every dollar they put into elections they get $100 back. $50 million worth of donations that we could identify went in, $5 billion worth of public policy favors came back to them at our expense. We are paying for their welfare benefits. And that, that is something that we have to come to terms with. I don't care what your top concern is. I don't care what your number one issue is. If you care first and foremost about the environment, God bless you. If you're concerned about the future of education, and you sure should be, because public education is under assault in this state. If your primary concern is about senior citizen issues or health care, you are not going to get public policy made in the public interest on any of those issues as long as we have a democracy that has degenerated to the, the kind of system that we have today in Wisconsin where we have less than 1% paying for the election campaigning and then getting $100 back for every dollar that they put in in the form of welfare benefits. We have to do something about that. And I can best describe this dilemma using some federal campaign contribution numbers. In 2010, in 2010, one quarter of 1% of the population put $1.5 billion into federal election campaigns. Their average donation was about $2,000. Now, 
the democracy campaign has put forward a, a reform plan that we call ending welfare. We could have just as easily called it the 5% solution. Because in 2010, one quarter of 1% of the 311 million Americans put, put in a billion and a half dollars to influence federal elections. If we don't need half of the people to donate, we don't need a quarter of the people to donate, we don't need 10%, a tenth. 5% would do. If 5% of Americans gave contributions averaging $100, that would raise the same amount of money, $1.5 billion. We could wean elected officials from the addiction that they have to the less than 1% that pay for them to deliver the kind of government that that, that elite wants. We could, we could wean them from that system and we could have elected officials who can belong to us. And we have to be willing to fight for that. But that leads me to the last thing that I want to say about what we need to understand. When we think about what ideas do we need to, we need to grasp in order to get our arms around this challenge that we face in our democracy, what I would say is that we need to understand the full measure of what we're up against. We are entering another civil war in this country. We are facing a challenge on that magnitude. Now, the war will take a different shape. There will be no Mason-Dixon line. There will be no Union, no Confederacy. There will be no Gettysburg. There will be no Appomattox Courthouse. But we are entering a period of civil war in this country, and we need to understand the full measure of what we're up against and why. And, and that's, that's where I want to finish up. We are, are living in what I would describe as the third stage of ownership in our society. Now, if you say that we're in the third stage, that implies that there have been two earlier stages. There have always been tools that the ruling class has used to keep the population in place and, and, and exert control over us and, and exercise power over, over us. At the beginning of our country, of course, one of those tools was slavery. This nation started as a slave nation, and most of our nation's founders were slaveholders. It also started with institutionalized voter disenfranchisement. At the beginning of our country, we forget that in order to have a voice, in order to have a vote, you had to be a white male property owner. It wasn't enough to be white. It wasn't enough to be male. You had to be white and male and property. And at that time, that whittled the population down to about 10%. Of the, of the American people. That was the first stage of ownership. That's how the ruling class exercised control. Well, eventually the abolitionists won and slavery was abolished. Eventually the suffragettes won and women won the vote. And eventually the vote was expanded to virtually the entire adult population. But that did not mean the ruling class was about to surrender control and relinquish power. They moved on to the second stage of ownership. In slavery's place came Jim Crow in the laws of segregation. And in, and in the place of of disenfranchisement came voter suppression, it came literacy tests and poll taxes, and that's how they exercised control. And of course, by the 1960s, after generations, decades of struggle, the second stage of ownership was swept away by the Voting Rights Act and the Equal Pay Act and the Civil Rights Act, and eventually Title IX in 1972. And, and for all intents and purposes, the second stage of, of ownership was demolished. Now, I will say, I don't want to overstate this case. There are still dimensions of the second stage with us. And in fact, the, 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 the bill to require photo ID is a classic example of a second stage tool that is still with us and still being foisted upon the state of Wisconsin. But they have really moved on to a third stage of ownership. And that is the creation of a political marketplace where participation is, is, is too expensive for most people to afford. And that's where money is speech. Corporations are people. Those kinds of doctrines, that's what we're up against. And we have to, we have to rip that design to shreds. We need to understand that design, and we have to rip that design to shreds. And I, I simply want to say, 
we are entering into a period where the challenge is as great as what those who fought the Civil War faced, what those, those freedom riders who got on that, those buses and who risked being beaten, what they faced. We face challenging times, but I simply want to say this in closing. We are about to fight a war without borders. There isn't any Mason-Dixon line that we can identify, but we do have to understand what we're up against. We have to find a way to win this war, but I, I, I think we really have to understand this. We don't have to make history. We only have to repeat history. Because right here in the state of Wisconsin, remember, Robert La Follette Jr. was once replaced by Joe McCarthy. Sometimes Wisconsin messes it up pretty bad. But, but Joe McCarthy was eventually replaced by Bill Proxmire. We have been through these kinds of times before, and Wisconsin has always risen to the occasion. We do not have to, to make history. We only have to repeat it. We don't have to do anything that hasn't been done before by people right here in Wisconsin. We can take comfort from that history. We can draw inspiration from it. We have to rip this design to shreds. We have to win this new civil war. We have to usher back in a time when the Joe McCarthy's of the world can be replaced by the new Bill Proxmires. Thank you. give you uh, one of our no-nos. Somebody asked me the question, could this group endorse candidates? And the answer is no. We're a 501c3 organization. That's, uh, we don't endorse. As much as I want to help Paul Ryan, it would not be good for me to endorse him. I, w I will not be on the campaign trail helping the governor no matter what he says because it would be wrong in terms of our tax-exempt status. So I hope you'll appreciate the fact that we have to have that discipline, and that's why we're not going to endorse any candidates. Um, before we ask Ruth Conniff to come up here, I'm going to have her introduced by somebody that some of you may have seen on television once in a while, uh, John Nichols from the Madison Capital Times. If, if there's a more passionate, or articulate spokesperson for progressive causes. I have never met that person, so please welcome John Nichols, who is going to introduce you to a wonderful person from Progressive Magazine. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I was out east uh, at a thing in New York City last week talking about, everybody wants to talk about Wisconsin, which is cool. I've always done it, so it's not new to me. But, and, um, and you get it's this big, very intellectual audience at City University of New York. And, um, and, and, and I got up, and they, they did not applaud. And I was like, what's with that? And, and I had to explain to these very intellectual New Yorkers that the reason everything has worked so well in Wisconsin, the reason they are studying us is because we are really polite and generous. And so we give great rounds of applause to people, whether they speak well, whether they speak poorly. Uh, we even applaud them before they speak. And they were shocked by this. They were also shocked by, uh, by the notion that we have so incredibly many talented people in Wisconsin. They're like, how, what, what is it about Wisconsin? Everybody there is articulate and smart, and slightly above average. And, and I said, well, you know, we have great schools in Wisconsin.
And we also have great traditions in Wisconsin. This is, as some have pointed out, I don't know if you're aware that Robert M. Pollock was from this state. And in addition to being the governor and the senator, and, and really the only role model that we've had for Ed Garvey, uh, <laughs> Robert M. La Follette started a magazine back in 1909 called La Follette's Magazine. He did not suffer a lack of ego. <laughs> and, uh, but over time, he changed the name of the magazine to The Progressive. And since 1909, the Progressive Magazine has been the single steadiest champion of peace and economic and social justice in this country. That magazine has never, ever wavered. It has never backed down. And nobody who has ever picked up a copy of The Progressive has ever gone soft in a fight with the likes of Scott Walker. <laughs> so I am incredibly honored to introduce to you the brilliant, brilliant, and I, she's got a lot, she's had many titles at The Progressive, but I always call it, this is the bottom line, Ruth Conniff is the political writer for The Progressive. She is the person at that magazine that writes about politics, and she writes about it with an unblinking and unbowed, unbent style that very few journalists do. She speaks truth to power, and she is the mother of my child's playmate, Rosie. <laughs> And she is one of the, the warmest, best, and most positive voices for this incredible struggle. Please welcome Ruth Conniff from the Progressive Magazine. It's another thing to see 
your home state taken over by people who want to liquidate your public school system and privatize it, sell off your natural resources, and consolidate power by destroying the very democratic process itself in our state. And that is clearly what is going on. And these people are so extreme. The Club for Growth is now running ads against Tommy Thompson because he has the audacity to support the idea of health care. They are bashing Tommy so hard, I was looking for him here on the program for Bob Fest. <laughs> now, in a few short years, the right-wing revolutionaries from Wisconsin who are leading the nation now, and the right-wing revolution in the nation, have turned Tommy Thompson into a great progressive. They've moved so far to the right. So, I really, I, I urge you to go to Wisconsin Eye and watch video of the assembly on Thursday where you can see Mike Ellis with his dark sunglasses on, chewing gum, and telling Fred Risser, the longest serving member of the state senate in Wisconsin, to sit down and shut up, because they are shutting down debate and they are ramming their voter ID bill through. It was the most outrageous demonstration of the contempt that these people have for democracy itself. And you just have to see it to believe it. This is not what Wisconsin is about. This is not what our state is about. And we in Wisconsin take this very personally. I sat in the education committee hearings when they were pushing, trying to push through Senate Bill 22, uh, part of which will create this statewide charter school system, as you probably know. It's a, no longer will local school boards have control over issuing charters and controlling charter schools, but this board appointed by the governor, the Fitzgerald brothers, six-member board will issue these charters to schools, they can be online schools that can receive the same per-pupil money as a bricks-and-mortar school. So the, the prospect of this vast statewide network of online academies is particularly scary for people who live in northern and western Wisconsin where there have been school closings and where students are already traveling long distances to get to their school. People came out to that hearing. It, it was an amazing thing to see. People just poured out from around the state to say, our school is the heart of our community. We cannot lose our school. And Senator Weinhoff, who's here today, was sitting on the committee asking these pointed questions of these charter school folks who were making their presentation. Luther Olson, the chair of the committee, got to listen to the music teacher from his own home district talking about how Watoma schools are, based, are bracing for the worst and just how incredibly upset people are by the prospect of basically this liquidation of their schools. Alberta Darling was also on the education committee. She was in there texting on her cell phone the whole time, really not paying a whole lot of attention. But at the end of this music teacher's passionate, tearful testimony, she said, oh, thank you so much for all the work you do for the children. You know, both Luther Olson and Alberta Darling are facing some pretty energized recall efforts in their home districts. It's, you know, it's not a great position that these Republicans are in in the state legislature. It's not so great to listen to your constituents explain to you that you're going to ruin their school and destroy their local community in your own home district. And they're starting to feel a little uncomfortable about it. I think the longer it takes to push these measures through and the more people hear about them and come out to hearings, the more they start kind of wiggling around. I was sitting in these hearings asking myself, how do you get in this position to begin with? And Mike McCabe can explain it very specifically. You know, this, that one of the things that has happened in our state is that the school choice groups now rival Wisconsin manufacturers and commerce as the chief donor to Republicans. In the last campaign, they gave about 900000 to the million that WMC put into state races. So they have grown very, very big. Luther Olson's second biggest individual contributor is a man you've never heard of named Richard Sharp, who works for the Alliance for School Choice and resides in Richmond, Virginia. So make no mistake, there is a national right-wing push that has nothing to do with Wisconsin that is pouring money into our state and, and trying to destroy our state for its own various reasons. But it is starting to bother even Republicans in the state of Wisconsin. Scott Walker went to Washington, D.C., where he was funded by the American Federation for Children, which is run by the billionaire DeVos family in Michigan, the Amway, the Amway fortune. They have put the most money of anybody in our country into 
uh, voucher and charter school programs to destroy the public schools. And he, as he was speaking to this group, it was the most inane speech you've ever seen. He read a Dr. Seuss book and he talked about how he's for the children because all children should realize their potential and that's why he's making the biggest cut to education in the history of the state of Wisconsin. And he also made an announcement that came as a bit of a surprise to his Republican colleagues in the state legislature that he would be expanding his voucher program out of Milwaukee and into Racine and Kenosha and Lloyd and Green Bay. He hadn't even told the senators and assemblymen from those districts. And they didn't like it that much that they found out by watching him on TV in Washington, D.C. make this announcement. And in fact, they started to make some noises about how they weren't so thrilled about that. So Walker is beginning to experience, Mike Ellis, in fact, was one of the, he was one of the most prominent spokesmen against the lifting of the voucher camp. You know, now we all, all us taxpayers get to pay money to send rich people's kids to private school because he's lifting the income camp on vouchers. That's part of Walker's plan. Even Mike Ellis, that was too much for him. So there are cracks, there are cracks building up. We are, nonetheless, we have, <laughs> Common sense and the interest, the basic public interest and the basic interest of constituents are up against a great deal of money, as Mike McCabe explained. It's really clear. Paul Ryan, leading intellectual of the Republican Party now. <laughs> Budget committee chair and fundraising machine. Uh, you know, he has a plan that will take $4 trillion.